This cheese is being stabbed. So molds can grow inside. Without molds, we'd have a very bland cheese world. But an important slice of this world could be in danger. All of the globe's brie and its funkier cousin camembert relies on one strain of white mold called Penicillium camemberti. It has been cloned for over a century. But now, some French scientists say it could be on the verge of extinction, putting an industry worth billions at risk. It's crazy risky that we've got one ingredient going and producing all this cheese. We're on a bit of a panic mode that what are we going to do as a replacement? But finding a replacement mold in the wild would be really hard. Literally a needle in the haystack. So why is the iconic white mold at risk of dying? And what does this mean for cheese lovers around the world? Many cheesemakers globally get their Penicillium camemberti mold freeze-dried from labs in France. This includes Simon Berry, who runs the Whitestone Cheese Company in Amaru, New Zealand, which has specialized in artisan cheese for nearly 40 years. He pays $50 for this dose of mold, which will give him 240 large wheels of brie. Simon's team starts its brie out just like any other cheese, with a big vat of warm milk. They inoculate it with mold at this stage. We rely on molds to give us all this flavor and all this creativity. Cheeses injected with molds like camembert and gorgonzola tend to have more pungent and complex flavors than those made without it, like mozzarella or cheddar. Moldy cheeses can also be more expensive. They got their own personalities, they're their own wee stars in themselves. No matter the mold content, cheesemakers add rennet to curdle the milk, separating it into solid curds and liquid whey. But it's going to turn as almost like a custard texture. They dip in this giant knife to cut it in one direction, and then the other. They still do this part by hand, so they can feel how the curds are developing. They want them to be about the size of a die. The inside is still slightly gooey and, and shiny. This is one of the only automated steps in the process. The machine can lift nearly 500 pounds of curds and tip them over the ring molds. Workers move as fast as they can to fill each one by hand. The company donates all the liquid that drains out to local farms for animal feed. The team can make over 8,000 mini brie wheels a day. These rounds will chill in the fridge for 24 hours so gravity can start knitting those curds together. Once they've removed the ring molds, workers flip the wheels twice a week to make sure the fungi can begin growing evenly on the outside. After 12 days, they submerge both the small and big brie wheels in a saltwater bath. Probably not quite as salty as the Dead Sea, but we add salt to it twice a week. That brine adds flavor and serves as a natural preservative. Finally, these wheels head to the aging room. So they're kept at around 10 to 12 degrees, which is the optimal temperature for growing the mold. This is where the mold does its best work. In just two weeks, the Penicillium camemberti creates a fluffy layer on the outside and turns the inside sweet. At this point, workers package up the rounds. They'll cut the big wheels with wire and wrap the triangles in wax paper, which helps the cheese stay dry, so it'll keep longer. Smaller rounds are packed in another room using this machine. But no matter the size, each wheel ends up being creamy, mild, and buttery with a slight funk. It's that flavor that made Penicillium camemberti a global sensation to begin with. Humans used to make cheese from a variety of wild molds, but over the centuries, they domesticated them, similar to how a wild grain, after many generations of breeding, was turned into the corn we eat today. They started by manipulating the environment, like placing the cheese in damp caves or aging it on different kinds of wood, eventually figuring out which molds were tasty and not toxic to eat. You cannot domesticate in one, two, three generations. It, it really needs time uh, to evolve, to adapt, to be domesticated. Early versions of brie and camembert were very different from today. They could have been orange, gray, or even blue. 
if you went to buy a camembert wheel at a farmer's market in France, it'd be like 250 years ago, it would have been just like blue and kind of stinky and maybe smell like, you know, a wet basement. The problem was there was a risk those early domesticated molds could reproduce and create toxic babies. In the late 1800s, French scientists found and isolated a very rare penicillium mold with a genetic mutation that made it albino. They called it penicillium camemberti. It made cheese that was creamy, tangy, and pretty. And people loved it. It also grew quickly and made consistent batches of non-toxic cheese. Soon, cheesemakers across France and the world started going all in on this new mold. But what made it so popular could also be its demise. There is no genetic diversity uh, within penicillium camemberti. For the past seven years, Jean Ropas has been researching how cheese molds adapt for the French National Center for Scientific Research outside Paris. And in 2024, it was her lab that sounded the alarm that Penicillium camemberti could be on the verge of extinction. The mold has another genetic mutation that makes it reproduce asexually. To replicate on cheese crusts, it releases spores that are genetic copies of their parents, aka clones. After over a century of cloning, Penicillium camemberti is producing fewer spores than it used to. If you don't have spores, it's difficult even for the cheese producers to have a good amount of penicillium to sell it. And Jeanne worries more cloning will only cause more bad mutations. After a long, 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 long time, the generation uh, is causing this. Diversity and sexual reproduction is necessary for survival. It's also really unlikely we would find another Penicillium camemberti in the wild. It developed that white color likely because it was growing in a dark cheese cave, but that also leaves it with very little protection. The blue color of the ancestral mold is almost like a sunscreen. It protects it from the stress of UV light. The lack of genetic diversity makes it susceptible to pests too. A disease could quickly wipe out the whole strain. Survival of the fittest would not work out for it because it's not fit. You can say, we don't care because it's on the cheese. It's more big than just mold in the entire world. We are losing biodiversity. Many industries rely on limited crop variety, allowing for the quick spread of disease, like oranges, kiwis, and the most popular banana in the world, the Cavendish. It has been cloned for decades, but now a deadly fungus is decimating the trees globally because there's no resistance. And scientists are now rushing to find new varieties that can resist the disease. While there aren't any diseases threatening Penicillium camemberti mold now, its vulnerability is really concerning to producers. Nervous because, you know, if you go to, go to order your mold and it's not going to turn up, well, what are you going to do? Uh, oui, je suis concerné par l'avenir du camembert euh, complètement, oui. Charles Briand is a third generation cheesemaker in Normandy, France. He's spent years perfecting his camembert recipe, which he now sells under the label Le Cinq Fer. And he loves what Penicillium camemberti does to the cheese. Euh, bah, elle vieillit, et après, le, le fromage, il devient un petit peu marron sur les arêtes, sur le tour, et le fromage est aussi crémeux. He makes his camembert the traditional way, with unpasteurized milk. Bon, dès que j'ai le lait, c'est le moment où j'ensemence le lait. His process is steeped in tradition. For one, he still ladles the curds into molds by hand, just like cheesemakers have for centuries. His team does this process five times, waiting an hour in between for the liquid to drain. On peut pas faire les cinq fois en même temps parce qu'il enfin, y a pas assez de place dans les moules pour verser les cinq louches d'une seule fois. As it ages, on peut dire que ça moutonne. With four of his brothers also in the business, there's a lot at stake if his white mold goes extinct. France is the birthplace of brie and camembert, and a top producer globally, so it could be hit hard if there's a mold meltdown. Tous les producteurs de camembert seraient ou seront concernés, donc euh, ce sera un, un changement global. But Charles doesn't have the time to find a new mold to replace camemberti. And even if he did, it would cost him a lot of money to figure out how to work with it. Mais il faut beaucoup de temps parce qu'il faut faire beaucoup d'essais. Je suis quand même fermier, je suis pas, euh, voilà, j'ai pas une grosse équipe, euh, je suis tout seul. Euh, And he says French consumers might have a hard time giving up that taste. 
Parce que produire, euh, produire c'est très bien, produire, faire un beau fromage, mais il faut forcément, il faut réussir à le vendre derrière. Traditionnel. Nous, en France, les gens, ils ont une certaine habitude. Et par contre, si on est en Nouvelle-Zélande, je pense que les clients, ils n'ont pas forcément l'habitude d'avoir euh, du camembert. Donc, euh, si on leur présente une nouvelle forme, ce sera moins gênant, c'est sûr. À moins que ce soit des Français qui habitent en Nouvelle-Zélande, et là, ça ne va pas aller. Simon a vu juste ça, un appétit parmi les consommateurs consumers to try new cheeses. When I was a kid, cheese was the one kg block of cheddar or Colby. The range available now in New Zealand of all these different flavor profiles is, is significantly changed. All this demand has allowed him to experiment. And that's how he came across a new kind of blue mold the world had never tasted before. It was discovered on a hay bale on a farm two hours away. The hay bale was also wrapped and that kept the moisture in there. So high altitudes, that would have been cold and very similar environment to um, a blue cheese in this, in this cave. Whitestone says this is probably one of the only non-toxic molds found in the wild and commercialized in recent decades. Simon had to get permission from the government to start making cheese with it and prove with lab tests that it was safe to eat. At first they were like, what are you guys doing? This is mad. And then they saw the light. Once he got approval, it still took the team six months to figure out how to work with it. The first cheeses we made, we went into the maturation room and you picked them up and it was like a powder. Whitestone named the cheese Shenley Station Blue after the farm where the mold was found. Unlike Brie, these rounds don't get a brine bath. Workers punch the wheels out of their ring molds and roll them in salt by hand. This makes it easier to control the salt levels. Too much and the cheese might taste too bitter. Also, they can't put these in the same bath as the white cheeses because they don't want to cross-contaminate the molds. Mixing molds could create unpredictable flavors that they don't want. This machine pierces the wheels so the blue mold can reach inside. Piercing feeds oxygen, letting that blue mold grow and, and thrive in there with an oxygen feed. The team stores the blue cheese at 48 degrees Fahrenheit in a separate aging room to keep the two molds apart. Just like Brie, the Shenley Station Blue will get sweeter as it ages, but instead of creamy, it turns crumbly. It gets firmer, so it's drying out over time. It's a lovely little environment for that blue mold to grow and develop flavor. We turn these cheeses by hand twice a week, keep them round, keep the circular. After up to six months, the wheels are ready for packing. This device slices the big wheels in half and then into wedges. Then workers drop them on the packaging line and New Zealand consumers have loved it. We can barely keep up with um, demand in terms of capacity. Simon sells his wedges of Shenley Station Blue for nearly double the price of a slice of brie. It's a mild flavor. It melts beautifully into pasta sauces and, and as a cooking cheese, it is sensational. He hopes his story can send a message to brie producers around the world. Go look for new molds. Like the Indiana Jones of cheese. But finding a new white mold could be much harder. So white molds are not really present in the wild. In her lab outside of Paris, Jeanne collects cheese crusts from around the world, searching for mold diversity. Where did this crust come from? People just uh, gave me crusts. First, she'll swab the mold. Then she'll isolate it on a Petri dish and study it under a microscope. When you compare like more natural cheeses, uh, you can see that you have a diversity in terms of molds and fungi on the crust compared to something which is more industrial when it's all the same, all beautifully white. She sequences the mold's DNA to learn how they've adapted over time. She thinks a fix for our overdependence on just one white mold lies with an ancestor to Camemberti, Penicillium biformi. That could have been what made the brie blue hundreds of years ago. There is a huge diversity in terms of colors, also in terms of genetics for sure. It's more common in the wild, and it has that blue color for sunscreen. Ja has already isolated a few biformi samples in her lab. And here are biformi strains. on cheese again, and you can see that they are different, but you cannot really see it here. 
All these ones are before me. But to use it for cheese production, scientists need to find a strain that's consistent and safe to eat. And so they actually make this thing called cyclopiazonic acid, which can be toxic to humans. Obviously, you don't want to be making camembert that's toxic to people. Um, so we're going to have to do really careful work to check these strains if we do use them for cheese making to make sure that they aren't producing any toxins or anything that's not great for human consumption. Maybe then we can find a mold that will have a fighting chance against any future diseases or mutations. I'm excited to think that we could have our own strain, that we're not reliant on bringing in an import ingredient and saying, here's our one, this is how it tastes, and this is, this is how we do it. And maybe we can find a cheese the world has never tasted before. Absolutely eat the rind of a camembert. It's there to be eaten. I know some people find the taste of mold to be a bit bitter, and some people don't like the texture. Um, it's totally fine to scoop out that creamy inside and not eat the mold, but it's designed to be eaten.